It's wonderful to see you all here. I am so glad we can all be here together on this smoky, uh, delightful August evening. Uh, it is it's warm in spite of the smoke, which we can be thankful for. So certainly thank you for coming. My name is Brayden Murray, and I'm the director here at the Douglas Family Arts Center. And I am proud to introduce, many of you know, Sophie Lillois. She is uh, quickly... She's uh, quickly becoming one of the go-to people for W.J. Phillips in Canada, which I think is just excellent. Uh, we are lucky to have her, and frankly, uh, I think what she is going to talk about tonight is extremely interesting, the technical details, the history of it. Um, I did a little preview when we were in Manaki a few weeks ago, and uh, it's a wonderful thing. So, uh, without further ado, let us have the accident of your editor, Sophie LeBlanc. everyone. Uh, I have a bit of a tickle, but I am armed with lozenges and water. Uh, so hopefully that won't be an issue. Thank you all for coming tonight. I know it's the end of the summer. Everyone's quite busy trying to pack it all in. I also know that I am quite passionate about Philips. I will. I have a clock in front of me. I'm going to stick to it. Um, but we will have a window for questions at the end, as I know there will be many. So please hold your questions to the end. If you have a cell phone, turn it off, please. Otherwise, I will single you out. I'll just give you a couple seconds. Okay, so let's get right to it. Uh, I want to cover quite a bit tonight, um, but a few points just for us to keep in mind. So what is an art collection? In short, it's a selection of artwork. Why have an art collection? Well, to enjoy, but also to share a lens by which artists expressed a place, a culture, a time, or even a philosophy. What does art do? Art for the moment that we experience it has the potential to transport us to another perspective broadening our view of the world. That's the gifts that artists give us. So who is it for? It's for everyone. It doesn't matter where you're from, what you do, it's uh, accessible. So tonight I wanna share with you how special, because it is extremely special, the Douglas Family Art Center Walter J. Phillips collection is. My goal is for all of you to walk out of here with a sense of pride tonight. Pride for your love of Lake of the Woods and that of one of Canada's most influential artists that felt the same. And that there is a nationally recognized collection here at the Douglas Family Arts Centre in Kenora. There's the man, styling, pretty handsome. <laughs> So Walter J. Phillips is a celebrated Canadian artist who created hundreds of watercolors, etchings, engravings, and color wood block prints. Upon his arrival, upon his arrival uh, in Winnipeg with his young family, he came from England in 1913, Phillips was taken by the Canadian landscape. Throughout his 50-year career, Phillips would exhibit his work across Canada, the United States, and the United Kingdom. He created an enormous body of work, whose subjects included the people and landscapes of his native England, northwestern Ontario, the prairies, Rockies, and the coast of British Columbia. His love of watercolour would be a consistent medium throughout his career, both as masterful English-style paintings and plein air studies. Plein air just means you do it in the great outdoors, in the big air. As a printmaker, Phillips produced fine etchings and engravings that would gain an international recognition, as well as his woodcut prints. An innovator and technician, Walter J. Phillips is one of Canada's most distinguished graphic artists and is considered the master of the color woodblock printing in Canada. If you get a book of Canadian art for an international audience, there are very few print artists in there, but Walter J. Phillips will be there. It could all be painters and Phillips will be there. 
So what some might not know is Phillips was as much a writer as he was an artist. We are blessed in that because his written works are a necessary complement to his artistic record. He felt that the artist was dependent on the public and so th sought to inform them. He would share his eloquent way, his experiences and thoughts about art artists and art critics and the art movements of his time. Walter J. Phillips' artwork is avidly acquired by collectors privately, publicly, and corporately, both nationally and internationally. His pieces are numbered in the collections of many outstanding institutions, including the Smithsonian, the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, and the National Gallery, just to name a few. They're everywhere. So I just want to do a quick little nod. I'm sorry, I'm going to do this every chance I get. Thanks to Nikki and Bryce Douglas, <laughs> who spent 30 years collecting Walter J. Phillips artwork inspired by Lake of the Woods. The Muse, the Douglas Family Art Center, has a unique and nationally recognized collection. The Lake served as Muse through all of Phillips' chosen mediums. That is the only place that has inspired all mediums. It inspired his greatest production, defining his major period. In his career, Phillips would create 13 etchings, five engravings, 40 wood blocks, and hundreds of watercolors inspired by Lake of the Woods. So Phillips was born in 1884 in Lincolnshire, England. Due to his father's profession as a minister, they traveled around a lot. This fostered in him a love of nature and landscape. And he would write, I'm gonna quote him a lot. The beauty and wonder of nature are as alluring as the pursuit of art and made of me a landscape painter. So Birmingham was the home of David Cox. So this is one of, Briti one of uh, the greatest British landscape painters. The French would describe watercolor paintings from England as La Anglais. And it was celebrated because of its use of watercolor as its own medium in its own right with a focus on landscape. In this time, we're talking the late 1800s, traditionally this medium has been used as part of a formal British sort of education, being used as topographical maps, biological studies of plants, and architectural drawings, not as artworks in its own right, but in England they were. Studying watercolor masters such as Turner, Constable, and Cotman, Cox and DeWint anchored in Phillips a great respect for this British watercolor tradition and formed the primary lens in which he saw the world. It would prove to be the medium in which he expressed himself most naturally and be a consistent medium for the entirety of his career. He started with watercolors and ended up doing etchings, got into woodblocks as well, and engravings, and as his eyesight was failing in his later years, returned to just watercolors again. Phillips always championed skill and technique in all things, particularly choosing watercolor for its difficulty, as it demands a high degree of attention, depending on directness, speed, and intention. With other forms of painting, you can paint over. Oil and acrylic, you can say, oh, I don't like that, I'm gonna throw whatever. With watercolor, there's no forgiveness. You start with your lightest colors and you finish with your darks. And the beauty of watercolor is letting the white of the paper shine through. They are luminous for this reason. You can't do that with oil and uh, acrylic painting. But yes, unforgiving. It also kept him interested for its brilliance as he was a lover of color. This is one of his early English watercolors. Phillips, like other artists of the time, wanted to further his studies in the, acad in the academies of Paris. So he set off for South Africa in 1908. He had an uncle there uh, that he could stay with, and so he thought, I'm gonna go make some money. We're talking diamond mines and such. He didn't know, but he was gonna give it a shot. So he would spend four or five frustrating years didn't make a cent that he could keep in his pocket other than what he needed to spend, and so returned to England with little more money than when he left. That was a blessing for us. <laughs> the reason for that is, is that I think it's important to note that not studying in Paris 
further anchored him in this British watercolor tradition because he missed being immersed in the environment of Impressionism, Neo-Impressionism, Symbolism art, Post-Impressionism, Fauvism. This would contribute to a style that actually helped define him, kept him apart, stood him alone, uh, and helped define him from his contemporary, his Canadian contemporaries like the Group of Seven, who did study over in France. Upon his return to England, Phillips worked as a commercial artist in Manchester and then had a good fortune to be appointed art master at the Bishop Woodward School in Salisbury. It is said that this was really the, what marked a definite point for Phillips and solidified in him to be a full-time artist as opposed to somebody that would have to do work and get paid. He wanted the freedom to go about and do his own work. Uh, for the next four years, Phillips would go on many sketching trips, and it would be on these sketching trips that he would begin to master the water technique. That went a bit early. It is said that beauty was Phillips' touchstone, and it's true. He believed that taste was mutable. You know, there were fads, different things that were going on, what was popular in the time, but beauty was eternal. This expression of beauty in Phillips' work served to grow him an audience, which continues to this day. It was also uh, at Bishop's in 1908 that Phillips would meet and marry Gladys Pitcher. She was a student and at the time uh, became the love of Phillips' life. They would welcome John in Salisbury, the first of six children and the only one of their children to be born in England. The Phillips would immigrate to Canada in 1913 and for no particular reason chose Winnipeg which became their home for close to 30 years. There is some writing to indicate that they had family in the East and the West and didn't want to be close to either of them, so chose the middle. <laughs> Phillips was fortunate that shortly upon his arrival to Canada, he was appointed art master at St. John's Technical School, and it would be a position that he will hold until 1924. Being a teacher required Phillips to work full time, but again, he was determined to be an artist. It would be the following year that Phillips and his family would first travel to Lake of the Woods for a vacation. Phillips would write, on the prairies, the entire professional class summers at the lake, which is one of the most beautiful of God's creations. Join in the crew. So historically, there are a few artists that have painted landscapes at Lake of the Woods, but most of these artists were with the explorers or in that era and were traveling through on their way to Fort Garry, which is now Winnipeg. So we did have some Jacobi, Verner, Stevenson, um, but not people that actually stayed here and were inspired by this area. In 1914, Phillips joined this tradition that was established in 1883. Uh, with the opening of the Canadian Pacific Railway. So before the railway that joined Winnipeg to Thunder Bay, um, it was a lot more difficult for people to travel. But once the rail line came in, which made a stop in Kenora, that's when we start seeing the camps. And uh, he didn't have a camp himself, but they rented places and they knew others that did have camps. Beautiful scenes from the time. So Phillips would easily transfer his love of beauty and landscape to the Canadian landscape. Their first summer, the Phillips rented a cottage in Norman Bay. So they were here in 1914, and a lot of the earlier works center around Norman Bay. And also in that time, we're not driving. You can go around in a boat if you found somebody, but for the most part, you're walking around. And it was often safer to use the rail line than it was any road. So part of the fun of finding artwork is figuring out where he might have gone on foot. So Lake of the Woods became one of his earliest sketching grounds. He would return often over the next several years, if not with his family, then with fellow artists on sketching trips. So he would write. So let's put our minds back here. The village is two miles away. So he's a Norman and he's talking about rat portage. The village is two miles away over the water, but there are other cottages within call and numerous islands in the bay. Every day brings new adventures, whether we set out in the canoe on a short excursion or in the launch for a long one. The map pinned to the wall is a tantalizing document, as most maps are. And if there is any sense in nomenclature, the adjacent lakes and the streams spread out upon it are alluring to the last degree. One canoe route leads to Clearwater Bay through Granite Lake, 
the Lake of Two Mountains, Moss, Bear Mountain, Crow, Duck, and Rush Lakes back to the starting point. Desirable places, who would not wish to see them? Phillips enjoyed exploring the wilds and communities of the area, many of whose names feature in the titles of his work. This is a beautiful watercolor, a nice early one, and one of the only ones, let's see if I can do this, that actually, here's a figure here, and two tenths. We do see the odd canoe in some of his works, not a lot of his watercolors. This is the only encampment that I have ever seen Phillips do from this area. This is one that we did have to acquire uh, through auction. So we'll talk a little bit about how some of these pieces come into our collection and how we hope to continue growing the collection. So I just want to do this great one. Uh, again, remember the man's English. He's used to traveling the English countryside. He's here. He's arrived by train. Uh, it's 1916 around this point. And he's going around looking for inspiration. So. I spent one memorable night on a tiny remote island on Lake of the Woods. I had neglected to provide myself with a cheesecloth or netting, so my head was under a blanket, but the noise of the pestilent insects quarreling for standing room on the tip of my nose was rendering sleep impossible. I was up before daylight and put in the longest sketching day of my experience, beginning with a sketch of the sunrise and ending when it was too dark to see with the sunset. There were short intervals for meals, that night we rode as far away from land as we possibly could, extended ourselves as comfortably as might be along the floorboards of the boat and incidentally under the seats. Letting the boat drift, we composed ourselves to sleep, happy in the thought that we had fooled the mosquitoes for once. <laughs> So during his first two years in Canada, Phillips continued to produce these beautiful watercolors of this English tradition of his newfound home. In Winnipeg, Phillips would meet and become friends with fellow Englishman Cyril Burrard, an artist and etcher who would impart upon Phillips his love for etchings. So etchings is when you actually scratch in a plate of uh, copper often, and you will put your ink in it and you crank that through a press. Um, so you do need a, a big machine, a hand crank machine for that. Um, they would often uh, come, to, come to this area, travel around, and they would show together Burrard featuring uh, paintings and etchings and Phillips, mostly his watercolor paintings. So here's an example. So Phillips always had a fascination for printed works. His mom was a reader, even though the father was a minister. We, they had these little etchings that they would get out of books and some of them would be on the wall. So he loved this sort of printed works that might be in stories by Gustave Doré um, and may have accounted for also why he also liked working in a small style. What he did appreciate about etching, again, was the uh, high level of precision that was required. <coughs> Burrard would teach Phillips the principles of etching, and in 1915, Phillips produced his first prints. <coughs> Excuse me, this is Wooded Shore near Kuwaitan. I have to say that we do not have any etchings as of yet in our collection. I will plant a seed with all of you. One of the reasons uh, is that he actually um, didn't do this for too long. Before we do that, though, I'll show you this one too. This is a neat one. Uh, the museum staff, uh, Braden, Marcus, and I have had fun trying to find the Pierre Dubois. This is called Derelict Lake of the Woods, 1917. <laughs> Um, my understanding is that these are a type of gator vehicle. So the big, this is a vehicle, they were more flat bottomed. And if you needed to do a short portage, you could literally kind of hump over to the next body of water. So we did some digging and we do have a record of this vessel. Um, but what's neat about artwork is that sometimes it tells us about our history and because it's in the context of art, we give it a different sort of attention and do more research on it. So that's another one of the gifts of art. So a little funny story is that Phillips prints were featured in a window of Robertson Brothers Art Shop in downtown Winnipeg. 
One day, somebody lost control of their car and smashed through the front window. So that person not only paid for the shop's repairs, but also purchased all of Philip's etchings as well. And so it was that Philip sold his first prints. <laughs> that being said, the National Gallery recognized the quality of his work and purchased two etchings for their collection in 1916. So, Despite being very good at etching, he would give up the, meeting, uh, the medium entirely two years later, saying that he came to abominate, this is quote, he came to abominate the cold, unresponsive nature of metal and the smell of acid and oil and the dirtiness of printing inks. Of the 30 known etchings Phillips created, 30 were from Lake of the Woods. One of his examples of his beautiful watercolors. Part of the fun of the watercolors is trying to determine where these are. Because the landscape is sometimes the same and then sometimes not the same. And I'll tell you a little why also, because Phillips, Phillips is sneaky. So it should be noted that throughout Philip's experimentation with the etching process, he did continue to paint in watercolor. He was adjusting his eye and technique to different light, color, and subjects of the Canadian landscape. So similarly to when you're outside and there's a different time of day, especially August late afternoon, we know that lovely light, or what it's like on a bright winter day, when you go to different geographic locations, there's also a different palette of color. So Phillips, who's used to maybe more an English country countryside palette is now going in between a prairie sort of color palette and also this Canadian shield. So uh, sketchbooks would fill with drawings and watercolor sketches of a landscape along with notes and color subjects. So I did go to the Glenbow. They have most of his uh, sketchbooks there. Lots of beautiful pencil drawings with literally color swatches or color notes in the margins as he's uh, experimenting along. So sometimes he would do something right on site and depending would just be going in the sketchbook, go somewhere else, draw something else. So he would write, Yet beauty is everywhere apparent. The lake does possess a wealth of interesting detail that appeals with an intimacy which makes every object a possible shrine of beauty. So this is an example of one of his sketches. Those of you that know Summer Idol, which is over there, doo -doo, you recognize the little girl. So here she is here. As he's, this is his daughter uh, figuring out different poses. This is a similar composition to Water Baby, which is in the National Gallery. So Phillips enjoyed the company of fellow artists on sketching trips and traveled to the lake with Berard, uh, Frederick Brigden, Jr., L.L. Fitzgerald from the Group of Seven, Eric Bergman, Fran and Franz Johnson, just to name a few. There is quite a troop of them that would come here. He was a, f uh, a contemporary of the Group of Seven. Of Johnston, he would admire his way with color and Carmichael's watercolor technique. Let's see here. There's another one of his sketchings with a pen and ink. Those of you that know kind of like the poster, Sunset Lake of the Woods. That's right over here. Thank you, Rosemary, for pointing that out. So this is Sunset, uh, this is Sunset Lake of the Woods, if you recognize the island here. And he was quite fond of these uh, tangled foregrounds, shall we call them? Let's see here. Uh, so Phillips and Fitzgerald would not only sketch together, but they would also exhibit together as well. And it was common for the two to rent summer cottages in Norman Bay next to each other. Once asked where his preferred sketching grounds were, because of course he did do the whole country uh, from here west, Phillips would respond, wherever I happen to be, it is light I paint, the sun and its corollary color. In 1917, he said the beautiful simplicity of the woodcut dawned on him, and once he decided, was determined to produce his first print. At the time, the medium was undergoing a Western revival in Europe and in the United States under the influence of the Japanese technique. The Japanese technique is very different. Now in Japan, the early color print was the result of three men collaborating. You had the artist that created the design, the woodcutter that cut the wood. Sorry, I should not be touching that. Uh, the woodcutter that cut the wood and then the actual printer that would execute the prints. 
In the West, the artists who desired to make color woodcut prints was forced to do everything themselves. So despite being essentially self-taught, Phillips became an avid student and dedicated himself to perfecting the technique. Quote, I had therefore all the fun of experimenting blindly, more or less, which perhaps fired my enthusiasm. He would delve into printing, creating 39 prints over the next five years, 26 inspired by Lake of the Woods. Now let's remember color wood block print. These are all color wood block prints with the exceptions of here, engravings here, which are also actually carved wood. You have to carve a block for each color. You have to lay the same piece of paper down exactly on the next block and the subsequent block for as many blocks as you have per print. Some of them it's six, his record was 12. Many people have remarked that my paintings display a fondness for tangled foregrounds, screens of foliage, and they say it looks Japanese. So during this time also, we're talking that movements in Europe, we've got Art Nouveau that's happening and the arts and crafts movement as well. And Phillips was also influenced by these styles. So they had a respect for craftsmanship in terms of the arts and crafts movement and an emphasis in nature and the simplicity of form, which was more Art Nouveau and this resonated with Phillips. Even his early monograms, let me see here. This is Art Nouveau. So we're seeing more vine-like shapes. Again, we've got these beautiful florals that are here and in her hair. Very organic, sort of luscious, sort of feminine forms. But what is beautiful and what is not often discussed, although we can say that Phillips was influenced by Art Nouveau, is how he adapted it to here. So I call it boreal Art Nouveau, because instead of irises, think Tiffany's, instead of irises and tulips, he was doing water lilies and wild roses. Or instead of tangled vines, we have dangling jack pine. So he really adapted it to this environment. He was an amateur botanist uh, and really took the time to observe in a lot of his work. Let's see. So this is his monograms. <coughs> Excuse me, a monogram is a type of signature and this would be carved directly in the block. So there's different eras. And so there is a W here, and there is a stylized P, but it looks like a flower. I'm just gonna take a little sip of water. <coughs> you can see the evolution over time. He would also, to sort of um, guarantee that it was his work, you have signatures in the margin and the additions are numbered because should somebody get a hold of blocks, they could be printing them with the monogram in it, but he still has his signature in graphite because ink fades and graphite doesn't. Here's another little quote. Our cottage at Lake of the Woods is built upon a rock, a rounded mass of granite jutting out into the lake bare of any vegetation, save for a grove of young jack pines and a wild cherry tree. The veranda faces the sunrise, the sunset, and the northern sky, and the back door opens on the forest. There is a miniature cove with a sandy bottom and a ramshackle boathouse beside it, and we spent the summer months here, and each night we were lulled to sleep by the soothing night cadences of the waters and the wood. These are just a few of his early ones. This one, uh, 1918, golden hours, relatively rare. You can find it. Phillips being an amateur uh, would sometimes print on the wrong side of the paper. If he could get a hold of Japanese paper, that is. This is Aloha Cottage. This is not one of ours, but I always like to feature it because again, his masterful watercolor technique. This is just one of our granite rocks here, but it is exquisitely romantic. So this one is called Gloaming. Phillips would on occasion revisit a print, having already produced a full edition. Always reaching for perfection, Phillips would at times decide to change the composition of by altering a block or two. These different print runs of the same name, but with some alterations are identified as first and second state. 
So we do have this one in our collection, the second state. We do not, as of yet, have a first state, but you can see that he has taken away this sort of water uh, ripple effect over here and that he's changed some of the spacing in the canoe. Wow. This is his wife, Gladys. In this work titled Gloaming featuring Philip's wife Gladys, we can see that Philip's has eliminated the block used, the watercolor of the rippled surface, the width of the crossbar, as well as the shadows on the canoe, and shaded the face of his wife in the second one. You can see uh, he's given her uh, just a bit of an eye here as well, more of her loveliness. This one is uh, Mary at the Lake, and again, there's a first and a second state. Can anyone identify what is different between these two? Yes, Susan, speak up. <laughs> so, Phillips would predominantly use cherry wood, which is consistent with the Japanese medium, or the, its tradition, because it had a tight, uniform grain, which was, was well suited for carving. So it printed densely rich color evenly and consistently. It was also a little bit more resilient to changes in humidity, which would cause the, well to, the wood to swell or not. Through experimentation with different woods, Phillips made a beautiful discovery using fir. Now again, he's an amateur botanist. He's fallen in love with our landscape. He's an amateur who's educating himself as he can, but also extremely experimental. So this common conifer has a very distinctive grain as you can see here. And then this is a different one over here. A wash of color would print differently as a result of the difference between the softer, looser summer growth and the harder growth rings of winter. Phillips recognized how the grain of wood, when printed, looked like the rippled surface of water. This use of wood grain in his prints would be a distinctive element of Phillips' style, an example of his keen observation of nature's design but it would also. So Phillips, during this time, he's exhibiting regularly and would enter his work in international and national competitions. He would earn international recognition in 1924, winning the Storo Prize, first place, at the International Exhibition of Prints in Los Angeles for his print, Norman Bay No. 2. There you go. Because, unlike anybody else in the world, at least presenting in you know, competitions, no one had ever used anything other than cherry. No one had thought to use another wood you can barely see it here. It's very subtle in this print. We have a nice curved rippling surface that then would mimic the natural ebbing water in Norman Bay. So he was awarded this for his clever use of wood grain, was praised as it mimicked, I'm singling you out, as it mimicked the natural wave action along the lake shore. <laughs> So it was a common enough practice for Phillips to develop a woodcut design from a watercolor. This one's called the dock. There is a watercolor of this one, but again, you can see some wood grain here in the background. Again, using that technique. So this is a watercolor of Poplar Bay. Uh, it's not part of our collection. We hope it will be someday. Uh, but this is Poplar Bay Lake of the Woods. It was a common enough practice for Phillips to develop a woodcut design from a watercolor, maybe playing with the composition, tweaking color, altering things. So Phillips believed strongly that the artist had the right to omit or move elements of a landscape to suit the composition, provided, of course, that such changes did not transgress the laws of probability. <laughs> Those are his words. I mean, and you can understand it. Think about it. You're in a landscape and it's beautiful and you want to take a picture and then you look in your frame and you're like, it's not going to cut it. It's not going to capture what I'm experiencing here. So he, as an artist, decided, I'm going to take some liberties and I'm going to make that experience happen. 
<laughs> a landscape painting in which a composition is ignored is like a line taken from a poem at random. It lacks context and may or may not make sense. However comprehensive it may be, it represents only a fragment of what might have been seen at the spot where it was painted. Though only the part of a whole, a picture must appear to be complete in itself. There must be a judicious arrangement of all the parts. Considered conversely, the artist's task is to fill his panel with a design that conforms to its shape and beautiful unto itself. This is the woodblock. <laughs> It was lovely when we were hanging uh, the show the first time when we opened in 2019 because there was a group of locals that were clustered around this piece. So he did stretch, as I learned, historical accuracy with this popular piece. Poplar Bay Lake of the Woods, the watercolor, this one here, was shown at the Canadian National Exhibition in 1930, and he produced this print in the same year. So as I, was, as I learned, York boats, well, I knew about York boats, but York boats were crafts used by traders in this area and Manitoba, including on Lake of the Woods. Merchants would be traveling uh, through the Rainy River up Lake of the Woods and down the Winnipeg River. So this peach captures well our Canadian shield and the history of the region. That the, those that are from here would agree that York boats would have never been anywhere near Poplar Bay. <laughs> it's a dead end. <laughs> There's no camp there. It's a great place now, but it was not a happening place for York boats back in the day. But this historical note is overlooked given the beauty of the piece and our love of Phillips. So it is accurate that there were York boats, but not there. But I think we can all agree that's lovely. And this is lovely. So again, our sort of, this one is often identified as almost like the poster. So this is Sunset Lake of the Woods, 1928. This is a, this is an indicator of Phillips and how sly he is. So Phillips' command of these lake elements. He's got sketchbooks of trees, just pages of trees, of birds, of clouds, all manner of things that he might use here and there, and this could fit here and this could fit there. In this print, Phillips captures the you know, a hallmark of Lake of the Woods. We've got a chorus of pine trees, including this stoic sculpted pine on a granite island. In one of his unpublished manuscripts, he describes the designing of this print. He refers to a synthetic sunset, but I won't tell you what I mean by that. The island's location, despite its distinctive rock formations and towering pines proved elusive to some that looked for many years. You would never find it looking west where a sunset would be because Phillips, ever judicious in the organization of his composition, placed a sunset where none would be. For when viewing this island from this angle, you are looking south. What's the name of this island, Bill? Oh, I jumped ahead. What's the name of this one? The actual island. Oh, we, it's the only island. We have since named it Phillips Island. Okay, lovely. So Bill Mayberry, who is in back here, uh, a great dealer and uh, especially has a specialty in Phillips works, um, has a place here, was for many years looking for this island. Um, and so interesting that he has this little note in his manuscripts, but still. So by the mid-20s, the color print uh, revival was in full swing, and Phillips enjoyed good sales at home as well as through gallery representation in England and New York. This is one of the watercolors in our collection called Autumn Leaves. If ever you have our muse bags, this is the piece that is on, uh, on one side of it. But think about it. So there's not a lot of people doing color wood block prints in the area. There's no internet. You have to find odd periodicals or you have to travel. And Phillips is feeling very isolated in Winnipeg and felt that he had to get his supplies and tools from the end of the earth. 
Winnipeg was as far from any other major city, and although being the third largest city in Canada at the time could not compete with Montreal or the ever-growing Toronto. Access to art or periodicals is limited, and he had a few years earlier discovered The Studio magazine, devoted to color woodprint revival. From its pages, Phillips would learn about other artists in his field and printing techniques. Inspired, he would initiate a correspondence with artists such as Giles, an English woodblock artist who also produced the original color woodblock print magazine. And it was Giles that invited Phillips to England to meet with such prominent artists as C.B. Lee and Yurishibara. This is the family before their last one. So in 1924, Phillips would take a year of leave from St. John's Technical School, but he secretly sold the house and moved the family to England with no thought to return. <laughs> On the way, they stopped for a glorious summer in Muskoka. So there's a few pieces that are inspired from Muskoka. Phillips thrived in England, developing relationships with artists in the same field. He was just reveling that he actually had peers, different techniques. Yershibera, he holds so high. And it was upon him that uh, Yershibera taught him different Japanese techniques uh, for carving as well as sizing paper. Sizing is a way that you treat the paper prior to doing any printing, whether in some of his watercolors, he even would dip them in a type of uh, gelatin so that the water color would move uh, more easily. So despite Phillips in all his glory in England, the children hated England. <laughs> they were not at all satisfied uh, suffering social expectations of British society, and so it was decided for the children's sake to return to Canada the following year <coughs> with another stop in Muskoka. Mm -hmm. This is Summer Idol. So, Summer Idol was long considered a Muskoka piece. After he returned, he decided he was going to resign his position at St. John's Technical School in 1926, and he dedicated himself 100% to his art. Armed with a new set of skills, Phillips was invigorated and embarked upon his most challenging work in the woodcut medium. So there's two, two versions of Summer Idol there. Summer Idol is considered one of Philip's greatest prints. This work is one of his largest and is most technical with the carving of 11 blocks. The addition is 100, which means that 100 times he used 11 blocks. Unsatisfied with the registration, which just means how things line up each time he puts the paper down, it's said that he actually destroyed the first run and reprinted it all again. Again, he is fastidious and technical. So if it's not right, let's get rid of it. So make no mistake, though, that that piece is a Canadian treasure. It stands as the technical marvel that, dis that defines the standard of excellence in Canadian color woodcut medium and is one of the reasons why Phillips is considered the pioneer and the master of the technique in Canada. It is also one of Phillips' most beloved pieces. It won a bronze medal at the Canadian National Exhibition in 1926. Now, there has been speculation as to whether this print was a piece from Lake of the Woods or not. It was long thought that this book is inspired by Philip Summers in Muskoka, given that the print is 1926, so after 1925 and 1924 in Muskoka. But there have been clues in sketchbooks, which I showed you before, uh, that may hint to something else, but I can say with full confidence to you all that the mystery has been solved. This is the watercolor. It is dated 1921. <laughs> so you see, this watercolor has been a long guarded secret. The watercolor for Summer Idol has been passed through generations of a family who kept its existence discreet ever since Phillips painted it. They got it directly from him. The watercolor of Summer Idol has been found and is dated 1921, confirming that Summer Idol is from Lake of the Woods. So in this time, 1926 is the first time that Phillips travels to the Rockies. There's subsequent trips to the mountains, and over the years he would go to British Columbia as well as the coast, but he would continue to return often to the Lake of the Woods with fellow artists or his family. So here's the crew again. 
Immersed in the nature he loved and with more time for his family, summers at Lake of the Woods were a treasured time for Phillips. His family meant everything to him. He was deeply attached to his children and made sure to balance his work and his time with them. The Phillips children thrived at the lake, enjoying an idyllic childhood. So you can see, he didn't often include himself in his artwork, but you'll see there's the man in the same style and full white suit, including bucket hat and his eldest son, John. Their innocence and play made them perfect models for Phillips, who captured those precious early years in his paintings and his woodcut prints. It was at the lake that the children were most often featured in his work. So again, he's done prairies, he's doing the Rockies, he's doing the West Coast, and it was here at the lake that his kids featured in his artwork. Once they were grown, they had their own lives and they didn't feature anymore. So it, we are fortunate that when they were here, as many can attest to, that their children grew up here at the lake. Those works featuring his children were some of his most cherished. His daughter Lois said her father would pay them 10 cents a day to pose. <laughs> Flat rate, <laughs> even if that meant posing all day. <laughs> Quote, my young family disported itself in the water and along the shores all day long. Here was an exceptional opportunity. I made sketches of the children neuter in bathing suits. Every clear day the children and I worked together. Look at that face. <laughs> I've got a little one about that age. They all have these piercing gazes. The Depression years were very challenging for Phillips, raising a family of six children as a full-time artist. But Phillips persevered. He would take contracts illustrating books, taking commissions with the Hudson's Bay Company. He would write regular articles in the Winnipeg Tribune and even held auctions in his own house. The kids passing around dainty trays, selling his artwork for 30% of what he would have sold them otherwise. Phillips ensured that his children were provided for, original works were exchanged for rent, doctors or dentist appointments and music lessons. Phillips would paint the portrait of the Dean of the University of Manitoba in exchange for the tuition of his daughter Lois. It was during the 30s that we start seeing a lot of engravings. So engravings are carved wood, but they're black and white. He's not having them spend money on different colors and it's just one block. So he would delve into wood engraving. He loved the contrast and richness between the black ink and the bright white of the paper. Three of his engravings would be of Lake of the Woods. He didn't come here as often as you can imagine in the 30s. If he did, he always stayed with other people. So a highlight of the Depression years would be in 1933 when Phillips was elected a full member to the Royal Academy. That year, he would also receive an honorable mention at the Warsaw Woodcut International for his print, Rushing River, Lake of the Woods. Uh, we've been working, Noah is one of our summer students who's been working with a lot of institutions, including the National Gallery, who have been kind enough to share in their archival records a lot of Phillips correspondence, where he, now that he's a member of the Royal Academy, petitions to the National Gallery for money during this time. So, I just wanted to touch now briefly on some of our acquisitions that we've had since the Douglases have donated or are donating over 65 of Phillips pieces inspired by Lake of the Woods. Uh, just a quick note that in 1940, Phillips left Winnipeg for the Rockies of Banff and ha ha found the school there, and he rarely had the occasion to return to the lake thereafter. So I had the fortune of sitting in, uh, Marc Marichal is the curator for Power Corps of Canada and was giving a talk once and was talking about that the power of an art collection is in its focus, it's in its mission. So here, uh, like the Woods, uh, the Douglas Family Arts Centre, the foundational collection of Phillips' work is centred on Lake of the Woods. There are other pieces that he have done, celebrated pieces inspired by the West Coast or the Rockies, but what has gained us national attention is our focus here on Lake of the Woods' works. So how can we improve the excellence of our collection? By continuing to acquire quality works of significance. Also is the scholarly research, similar to the uh, Summer, Island, uh, Summer Idol piece, Summer, uh, the scholarly research that contextualizes the artwork to the people here and the history in terms of the Canadian context. Where do acquisitions come from? So uh, there are many ways. A lot of people can acquire them through dealers. 
that will sell them privately. Either they have them as their own inventory or they're selling on behalf of an owner. For us, we are fortunate that we have a great relationship with some dealers. So as an artwork becomes available, we sometimes get the call. Other ways that we do it is if somebody owns peace and has decided they wish to donate the work. So somebody that would come to us with a, uh, with a Lake of the Woods Phillips piece, it has to be evaluated by a third party, at which point they can donate it to us and receive a tax receipt in the amount for that value. Also, there are the epic battles that uh, can ensue in auction. So sometimes there's a piece that shows up and if you're fortunate, no one's looking. Uh, nowadays, there's more online auctions, especially since COVID. So there are different uh, shows that come up just throughout the year, or there are the epic live battles, which tend to be in spring and in the fall. If something comes up, you hope that there's not a lot of people that want to duke it out because uh, winter takes off. So uh, this is a piece that we had in the collection thanks to the Douglases. It's called the uh, Sunset Lake of the Woods. Again, one of the beauties of this collection and artwork in general is what, what it teaches us about our history. This beautiful piece uh, is unique. As you can see, it is signed, but there is no edition number. And that is because it is outside of the actual edition. This is the actual edition. We did acquire this one. This one is no less special. This is uh, him experimenting with different colors. So sometimes he's figuring things out. Uh, there may or may not be an error in this one. There is not. Uh, it's just him playing around with different colors. Some of these pieces he would have gifted to family members because again, they're outside of the official edition. So we did acquire this piece. What's lovely about this piece is in this area, the sailboat in this piece is called a scow. It's a boat which represents much of half the history of the Royal Lake of the Woods Yacht Club. It, is very pop it was very popular at the time of Phillips visits, competing in races, including the international races with boats from Minnesota, and is still sailed on the lake to this day. Uh, it's my understanding it's going through a revival right now as well. So this was a lovely addition to uh, our collection. This one is especially very, very special. This one is a memorial, and it is one of the best sort of tributes or nod to the professional class coming here and having a love of this place. So in 1934, Phillips was commissioned to illustrate a memorial poem for the late Margaret Craig by her husband, R.W. Craig, who served as Attorney General of Manitoba from 1922 to 1927. She passed away in 1934 in Kiwaitan of a heart attack. The Craigs had a summer place in Kiwaitan and were friends with the Phillips. As you can see, we are inside a cottage. This is called a place, a setting for a poem. So we almost have this sort of arts and crafts movement, uh, sort of William Morris curtains, for those that know this, or uh, a nice setting. And of course, this could be anywhere around the lake with our pine blue jay. And it is uh, a poem by Henry Van Dyke. So he was asked to produce a, poem, uh, a setting for a poem um, because she had been reading this, this poetry upon her death. The completed print was only sent to the Craig's close relatives and friends. There are only 34 that were made, and so it is exceptional that we have the privilege of this piece being in the collection. This one was, uh, we received a call from a dealer who made it available to us, and thankfully, we don't have a very robust acquisition budget, but we do have some wonderful supporters here. And so with the assistance of a generous patron, we were able to acquire this piece. And again, it also highlights that connection of the professional class and their love of the lake. This one. So when this one came up, I was actually contacted by Waddington's auction house because they wanted a specialist to write about two pieces that uh, were being made available to them from a collection in Washington state. Again, Philip's pieces have traveled all over. He did for a time uh, go to Chicago. He taught a semester down in the States as well. Uh, so, and again, back in the day, I think the 20s, the, you didn't need a passport to go to the States. We were much better friends than we are now. Um, so there's a lot of his work down there. So when I saw this, they're like, oh, I was like, sure, send them to me. And I, I momentarily froze, and then I jumped out of my skin. 
So we've talked about Phillips a little bit. He's using different elements for different pieces. And so why did I freak out about this one? First of all, it's a glowing representation of this beautiful, romantic, beauty, you know, this, this watercolor technique that he was so known for. It's extremely romantic for this part of the world. Um, and there's not a lot of them that feature a moon. I have not actually seen a moon in any of his pieces. You do sometimes see there is a, a smoky sun and smoke haze like of the woods, which is further down. Um, but we don't have a moon. Even in moonlight like of the woods, we see the reflection of the moon. We don't see the moon. So this was lovely. But what really impressed me is this is called Norman Bay. It's not Norman Bay number one. There is Norman Bay number two, but this is Norman Bay. So just go back and forth. And I never knew what identified this as Norman Bay until that watercolor. Take a look at this foreground here. This is our wild rose and Queen Anne's lace, which is featured right here. The watercolors are great indicators. They're the ones that are kind of truest to the area. It is from these watercolors that we learn the most even about the history of this area and his method. I'll show it to you again. We have our curved bay. Those are the boathouses in Norman Bay. And just for fun, one more time. <laughs> we don't have this either. <laughs> okay, so in this foreground, we have the foreground here. We have the boathouses for here. Now take this tree, flip it, and stylize the bottom. This is the same tree, even including this little spike branch, or these two little twigs. And he has stylized now our wild rose bush underneath. This one's 1934. Uh, I would love to have it. Again, York boats. Um, but beautiful the way that he's done it. I would love to get that piece. But yes, so this was an auction and we were not the only ones that were interested. Uh, again, thanks to the generous support of patrons, we were able to acquire this work. It is downstairs. It is one of the most important watercolors that we have in our collection and how it relates to other pieces as well as his technique in general. There are some that get away. This was in the same auction, and we had to make a choice. We had to, we had to say goodbye to one in order to try and secure another. There is an etching of this one called the backwater, and if you know your area, he's gone and walked around. Edgewater is here. So he has walked the tracks, and this is the Winnipeg River. I'm gonna point something out for you, Bill. Mm -hmm. So again, inspired by watercolors used in different works. I played with color a little bit so that I could emphasize this mushroom cloud. We call it the brain cloud. We being Shelby and I. <laughs> because it shows up one more time. Oh. This brain cloud is in no other piece. <laughs> this is 1918, it's his early wood blocks, uh, but it did feature originally in this watercolor that we had to say goodbye to in 1916. We love the watercolors, as I said, there's an etching of this one, and again, I can relate it back to, the, uh, back to this wood block. This is our latest acquisition. It was one that I didn't think we would initially go for. Um, but uh, I had to. I had to in the end because of, it relates to another one of our pieces that didn't have a place. We couldn't place where it was. So this is a piece that was on the original Douglas collection. And now we can place this. This is called Stream Akuaten, which means we can now place this one because this is Mink Bay, Mink Bay Trail. So in speaking again to the museum staff, we know that a lot of the people would go by foot and instead of going all the way down to rail bridges and different road bridges, they would create their own little bridges to go to the different mills to work. 
Now I want you to picture yourself standing right here. Turn around and look at the audience. What do you see? This would be on the other side. These rocks are in the background. So this piece we knew we had to have. It's another excellent example of his watercolor technique and anchors us again in the time when people are traveling around by foot. He's staying in Kiwaitan sometimes, at Kiwaitan Beach. Bain's Cottage is starting to become more prevalent. And now uh, we're starting to see these trips that he took by foot. The watercolors, we don't know how many there are. The prints, we know how many there are and we know how many additions there are. There's no mystery there other than can we still get them? The watercolors, colors we have no clue he's bartering he's changing things in the 30s we don't know what gems are out there uh, for me that's where I get very very excited a little older version so Walter J Phillips is a pillar of Canadian art his work is an integral thread in the artistic fabric of this nation Lake of the Woods served as the fertile grounds for Phillips inspiration while developing his technique and signature style it is his artistic expression of Lake of the Woods that provides the strongest tribute to the visual language defining this region his masterful technique in all mediums and distinctive style would bring an international recognition and worldly attention to Lake of the Woods. Phillips has managed to embed in his works an invitation to connect with some of what is felt when here at the lake, something universal. Any additions to this collection will further inform us about our history, and it is by growing this collection that we give proper tribute to one of Canada's greatest artists who has forever moved and inspired, as we are, by Lake of the Woods. The Douglas Family Art Centre is a place for these works to come home, to be shown, and to be celebrated. This collection is truly a national treasure. In closing, I'll quote Phillips one last time. I am always glad to be back there, and whenever I may have been, feel tempted to record some of the beauty that is everywhere apparent by those peaceful waters. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Yes, David. Before the Douglas family came forward, did the museum own any Phillips? No. Okay, really just from scratch? Yep. Uh, <clears throat> did he paint many winter scenes? He did not often travel here in winter. Uh, we do have a watercolor downstairs, which is predominantly uh, a fall piece. You can still see some of the ice is starting to form around the lake. He did write in some of his unpublished manuscripts that it was an unpleasant time to be painting <laughs> and that he could not work in watercolor because it would start freezing. So he has done lots of winter scenes, but they're all in Winnipeg. Oh. They're not here. Oh, why are all these sketchbooks in Glenbow? Because they were a part of the family and uh, Gladys donated them to the Glenbow um, wow. once he had finished at the band school and they were moving to Victoria, so the Glenbow got them. Yeah, you should. Wow. Yes? I'm lucky enough to live on Garden Bay. Yes. And when I saw the collection for the first time, I thought, there's so many pictures from Garden Bay. Mm -hmm. I wonder if he stayed there. And I also developed that theory about the way Yes, he did. And the fun part, as I said, is uh, when we get a watercolor, we kind of have to figure out where to be, but we can't be like, oh, this must be, because again, said rock formation may be there, may not be there. So we kind of get a general area-ish, but sometimes it's fun for me to say, ah, this is the tree from X or this is the other one. So there's a piece called Mourning over there that has a pine branch hanging down. And I have since discovered that the island in the back is actually Cathcart's Island in Muskoka, which is a different piece. There, there is a Cathcart's Island in Muskoka and that's the island that he included in Mourning. So sometimes, again, there's pieces from here that go over there, but so long as it gives the general feeling of the place, thumbs up by Phillips. <laughs> Any, yes, Bill? Um, can you comment on the importance of the, the block prints and when he discovered uh, the medium, how it separated him from 
so many watercolor artists that went on as career watercolor artists and how it changed them to become the artist that he, that he became. I think in a lot of ways when it came to Philip's woodblock is he was an excellent watercolorist and even his watercolors would have set him apart because of the power of this English tradition that he had. But it was the color woodblocks that really did sort of define him from everyone else. There were others that were doing lots of engravings like Bergman, um, but not so much color woodblock. Color woodblock is extremely ambitious and it does require somebody that is very technical. Uh, also conceiving in the design, how to then know how you're gonna break it up. So I've got an idea of what my picture wants to look like, but am I putting an actual green in there, which means it's its own block, or am I gonna carve a blue that I can layer over a yellow? It is something different, again, to be the designer. So to conceive of the image, then to be the designer of how it would be built and constructed, and then to educate, uh, execute it, there was nobody like Phillips that could do it like he did. And that's definitely, I would say, what set him apart. There were others that made this attempt and did valiant works, uh, but just didn't have that level of polish, didn't capture these subtle elements sometimes of a visual language or capture the light correctly. Anybody else? If I could have another one. The two of the girls, are they they're from the same blocks? They are with the exception of one. One block. There's one block that's different. I've actually embarked upon uh, a scholarly study. I've um, been working with the National Gallery. Every institution that has a Phillips piece, dealers that have handled them, conservators that have handled them, and I'm building a visual database as a means of comparison. I do have some challenges in that everything is light sensitive, so whether somebody put it in a sunbeam for years or not, uh, or whether or not, again, you've got 12 different blocks. Is it, hu is it rain? that day is it sunny that day so how is the wood how is the paper how thick did you put it on this time was the purple more thick than the red so there's all these different aspects but the one defining feature the one on the right or the one on the left is number 13 there's a lot more sort of warmth more pinks more yellows they tend to fade first but the defining feature of the one on the left is the pine block the pine block the wood that he used to create the ripples of water changed. I don't know when it changed in the addition. I would like to learn, so I'm building a database and working. I am putting my request to anybody holding them privately to just snap a picture. I don't need your piece, I'm not after it. Uh, but I am after the image. I want to use it as a means of research to see what we can learn for it. It is, as I said, a national treasure. It's the standard for color woodblock. It is in his top four collected pieces. It's a very important piece. It is very complex in that it has 12 blocks. So I am trying to do some research there. Uh, likewise, if there are people that have Phillips watercolors, if they just want to snap images and send them to me, I don't need to know where they live. <laughs> I just want to see them because it is through these pieces that we learn about life here at that time. We learn a lot by those watercolors. It's, and, and they connect to all sorts of different other pieces. So I have been putting a pledge out there. I'm sowing seeds amongst you all. Um, to share those images, uh, we learn a lot by the watercolors. They are the birth of a lot of other works that came after. Anything else? Yes, Susan. So if you have any, I know you have some here right now, but how many lit woods images are in the Crabbe collection of the pavilion? Quite a few. That is an exceptional collection. Mr. Crab was determined <laughs> and not always uh, 
not always the most gracious in his attempt to acquire works. There are hundreds, close to a thousand, I would say. Well, maybe not, that's just excessive. I would say there's definitely hundreds there. A lot of the watercolors for the wood blocks are there. And the difference in that collection is it is not as focused as we are. It is the whole gamut of everything that he produced. So it's not, but do you know how many are like the woods images? I don't know off the top of my head. I have borrowed quite a few from them, but I would say that there's there's well over a hundred. Yep. For sure. They were considered That's right. Yeah. Because, yeah. The, so if you want to see that collection, the Pavilion Gallery in Assiniboine Park on the second floor has the John P. Crabb Gallery. It features his collection. They rotate, it's the Winnipeg Art Gallery that curates the show and they rotate it once a year because there's such a depth to that collection. So uh, sometimes they pair it with other artists to give context to Phillips, but there's enough there. And I just, I every time I go to Winnipeg and go to Cinnaboyne Park, I go see Phillips, I go see Ivan Air. Um, but uh, it is well worth it to see the depth of that collection. It's incredible. Oh yeah, it belongs to the city of Winnipeg. It's not going anywhere. And it's free. <laughs> so throw some money in the donation box over there. <laughs> Any other questions? Thank you all for coming tonight. I'm very passionate about Phillips. I did control myself. <laughs> if you want, I can go off more, but maybe another time. Uh, there is a donation box on your way out if you enjoyed today's talk. Uh, my card is there as well. If you want to share tidbits, know where Phillips pieces are. Again, uh, there's wonderful reasons to grow this collection. If there's Phillips that you have that you're not sure what will happen to them, uh, I can give you some ideas. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you all for coming and have a great night.